Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So we have uh, will go through the step 5, we have finished uh, 4 steps uh, in terms of the global supply chain formation. Uh, so let us look at uh, uh, the, uh, the feasible configurations. What we did was after mapping the supply chain, we looked at the supply chain strategy, what are the kinds of innovations that are possible and we looked at what are all the supply chain risks that uh, they face and uh, so we are now ready to uh, look at what are the feasible supply chain configurations for implementation. In other words, we have we have done our homework in terms of the various uh, for our vertical for our company, what are the kinds of suppliers we need, who are the logistics providers, which countries are we in and we also have information on uh, uh, the uh, the suppliers uh, financial this one uh, which resources they have uh, which countries they are in what are their governments what are the delivery mechanisms and so on so once we have this kind of information that's possible then we could now use this to identify what are the feasible supply chain configurations so for the product of your company whether it is knowledge, product, solutions or value chains, identify the partners, companies and countries for goods, information and financial flows and also the risks of partnering. You should identify uh, the suppliers, you should identify the logistics providers, you should identify, identify the suppliers of information and also the financial, the banks and others and so on. Use the ecosystem information of partners of your partners while addressing the risk. In other words, you should do this so called multi tier risk management. Multi tier risk management is you should not, not only know about your suppliers, but their suppliers, their suppliers and go up to the mines. And this could be a failure of the government or a bank or an earthquake and so on. So there could, there could be any kind of problems that can occur. So you should lose the ecosystem information on this. Map the supply chain processes including methods of collaboration and also for ensuring partner loyalty. It's very important when you are outsourcing that the partner loyalty should be ensured. It's not only expected but it should ensure that the partner loyalty. How do you do it? Besides joint, uh, joint ventures or you have common uh, conferences, joint conferences with them you do whatever. So, whatever you do then it should be ensured partly one has to be highly careful about this. Map your supply chain for each customer order, have mitigation strategies for operational possible attacks, failures and so on. And how do you mitigate risk? I mean there are several ways in which in this AIMR research uh, gives you this. Um, so, we insert sensitive components and processes to protect IP. So, in other words, you do not outsource very sensitive uh, critical components and so on. Uh, that is what 41 percent of the people say. And we chose where to outsource based on the strength of IP protection laws. And we identify our IT IP before embarking on outsourcing relationship. We establish jointly developed protection requirements with contract manufacturers and design manufacturers. In state exclusivity requirements to reduce the risk of outsourcing. Dual sourcing to avoid sharing too much of IP with single sourcer. So basically, you have several methods of mitigating IP risk from dual sourcing to various kinds of protection and so on. So basically how to mitigate how to IP risk and uh, the most successful methods are, are given here in this. So in other words nothing is easy you cannot you cannot avoid 
any risk, but there are several ways in which you can try to mitigate and be prepared to do it. So, and then also you should do the, uh, uh, you know, map the enablers and the supply chain performance. What are they given this? I mean, here are some standard enablers for uh, supply chain, logistics, IT, trade policies and so on. But for your vertical, for your vertical, if it is oil, gas, this could be very specific and generic. You should, you should map those things. For example, here I said modular products, JIT, TQM and so on and logistics, IT, connectivity and so on. So, if you are using oil and ga gas, then it could be something different. You may need some asset specific requirements and trade policies and resources management and so on. So, basically, it is very important that you map this and find out what are the enablers for this. And then, of course, you can see what is the lead time and so on. How do you, what are the enablers? to make your lead time low at each at each point and so on and cost quality flexibility and others whatever are the relevant performance measures you and what are the current enablers if you want to change them if you can if it is possible to change them in terms of the delivery mechanisms and choice of partners choice of suppliers choice of countries you should do that so that and these enablers become very important. In other words, we are translating whatever the ecosystem, this one what we have into something very specific to which that will affect your performance of the lead time and cost and so on. So, when you are trying to get your feasible uh, supply chain configuration, then you should first map these and then use that. And when do we have at the what do we have at the end of the supply chain formation phase? So we have we said there are two steps in supply chain design. The first step is supply chain formation. What is supply chain formation? You collect all the players that you have, one their countries, their ecosystems, and all that. This is a phase in which you will collect all the information and map all the supply chain configurations. You do uh, some kind of a uh, higher level performance measurement, higher level risk assessment and so on. Now, this is a part of the, uh, uh, the strategic studies that any particular company should do, should be doing and the ecosystem map various network partners including manufacturing logistics and IT and their countries, regions and locations that is what we have, risks that the ecosystem faces, the innovations that are possible to make it big in the industry, the value chain architecture with outsourced or ownership details. So, this is a strategic phase with a lot of information collection and it is data dominant. Now, based on this data, you could do a lot of uh, analytics to find out which is the supply chain and so on. So, this is basically an important thing when people talk of big data, this is the kind of big data that you need for the supply chain design. So, this contains the textual data, it contains the data for the countries, it is contains opinions of experts and several things. Now, how do you select suppliers using this? You can use analytical hierarchy process, you can use uh, machine learning, uh, this one and so on. So, there are several methods, genetic algorithms to everything that is available or optimization techniques that are available. Now, those techniques are not the ones that are important. All this homework and the collection of data is the one that is important. So, that is the first step. So, once we have finished the first step, we get into the second step of uh, this one. Before that, there is what is called project planning. Now, it, it depends that whether you are talking of a green field or you are talking of an existing this one. In other words, what do we mean by green field? If you are, if you are, 
if you basically are want to invest in a new country, you want to build factories and you want to select suppliers and your selectors, selected suppliers also want to build their uh, assets in the particular country. Then you are dealing with project management which involves construction management of facilities, attracting partners, suppliers, coordinating service providers, goods and information delivery. So, this project management is very well studied subject uh, and there are a lot of some this one available for this, but you have to be extremely careful when you have to deal with any land acquisition problems and so on and also social problems. In other words, people should not protest against your entry into this and also you should be able to negotiate with the government with the social groups and so on. So, the kind of uh, 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 talent that is needed for negotiation is different in this particular case. So, possible cost and time, time overruns. So, basically your industrialization and land conversion creates tensions between the government industry and farmers because in 51 percent of in, uh, land in India is cultivable. So, some small farmers they basically own the land and the government has to have uh, laws to take it away from them and give some compensation. So, it requires several approvals and may require dealing with several government departments and this may result in time and cost overruns. IT logistics infrastructure could be weak and end to end delivery service providers may not be available. In case of electronic and apparel manufacturing, project planning involves partner selection, contract manufacturer from global list and developing connections. In case of auto, there could be land acquisition requirement and government permissions, then this step of project planning should be treated carefully. So, basically that is what it is and so on. So, Importantly, suffice it to say that uh, uh, that at the end of the first stage of uh, project of uh, supply chain formation, you have all the information that you need. Now, you have to build governance mechanisms or frameworks for partner selection, coordination and government. So, this is a please remember that what we are doing is a design. Now, design is not to a specific company or this one, it is a generalized design, it is a methodology or a framework that we are trying to develop here. So, this is a framework for partner selection, coordination and control. So, what we did so far is to have a list of players for each of the items that we need for the manufacturing items like suppliers of a particular component for services, services including logistics, audit, finance and so on. So, you have all the players in all the countries where you require that is you have a list. You have also what are the kinds of innovations that are possible in this, you, you can outsource, you can do whatever and also you have you have uh, uh, the all the risks, uh, list of risks that you may face during the short period of time the risk profile may change of countries and companies and the banks and so on. But as of now at that time, if we are talking of an ordering at that point in time, then we have those risk profiles. So, governance part of selection and coordination, a separate chain is formed for each order. How do you do the partner selection? In other words, you have this list, big list that we have. From that, you have to basically select the partners for the particular order. So, how do you want to do it? You want to minimize the lead time, you want to minimize the cost or you want to maximize the quality. What is that you want to do? Depending on that, you could do social network analysis, you could do optimization, you could do whatever to select the partners. So, and there is a structural features that you should also remember that your suppliers may have some asset specificity and you may require some special capabilities. So, you should see that your suppliers have those structural features and similarly the relational ties. So, your uh, business requires that your suppliers have some ties. It is not just the product you are looking for, you are looking for a social relationship with that country. 
So, if they have government connections, social organizations, cluster management, educational institutions, etc., those ties become important for you. So, does your supplier has the structural features, uh, the knowledge for and for manufacturing of the product that is promising and also the social capital. So, you look for that and then try to select your partner and once you select the partner determining who does what and when and communicating to everyone involves supply chain planning and visibility. This is standardized things once you know your product, once you have selected suppliers, once you, your product is standardized, you know the capabilities of all your suppliers, then how do you plan? This is the ERP systems and then supply chain planning systems of I2, SAP, Oracle and all that. You have this software that is available and also there is the supply chain visibility that is possible using uh, the sensor network, RFID tags and so on. There is the execution. Now, this is an important part uh, that happens. Execution is control tower monitor order status so that processes work as per plan and control exceptional events. Now, this is a kind of a new thing although it exists in several uh, other contexts like power systems, airlines and so on, but for the supply chains it is a new thing. Now, supply chains are used to thinking that you have planned and things will happen as per plan but they do not happen as per plan that is because of globalization, the long supply chains, the, the, the nature of uh, disruptions which, can, which are not mitigated and several other reasons. It is important to have a control tower which monitors the order status and the processes work as per plan. So, you have to basically when you are trying to build the next part of your supply chain design, you have to have tools, optimization tools or whatever. You have to based on your requirements, you should select your partners for the order on hand. If the order uh, is uh, depends on where the client is, you may want to minimize the uh, minimize the cost or uh, maximize uh, the quality or whatever. And you also do the supply chain planning coordination and also you should have some facilities for execution. So, let us look at the partner selection. The partner selection will identify suppliers for various components and services from all over the globe. That is what we have done already. We shortlist them based on the criteria mentioned such as location, countries policies, delivery costs, asset specificity, risk proneness, innovation capabilities, technology sophistication of hard and soft infrastructure. So, we are looking for hard and soft technology sophistication etc. And optimization, transaction cost analysis, social networks, several other things are used in the used in the pre-selection, use selection process. So, what are the mathematical models? The partner selection problem can be formulated using fuzzy AHP or multiple multi integer uh, programming and one can rank order the suppliers for each component based on the ecosystem parameters based on the transaction cost economics. So, what is the par TCE and partner selection? Transaction costs are the costs incurred to coordinate and connect the links in the global supply chain. What are the transaction costs? They are the costs incurred to coordinate and connect all the links in the global supply chain. Uh, they relate to finding a suitable trading partner, negotiating, setting up the contract and, and monitoring and compliance and so on. The transaction costs include observable costs which are transport costs, import costs, customs and so on and soft costs. So, basically if you look at uh, this one, we have already incurred the soft costs in negotiating, in basically getting all the information and so on and this. So, what we are basically look at now since we have we have already incurred into the soft costs in the supply chain uh, formation stage, what we have to do is they look at the observable costs and partly if you for a specific supplier once you have selected, if you want more information, then there are the soft costs associated with this. And the hard observable costs decrease with trade liberalization and decreasing transportation costs. The soft costs 
of social connections gain importance. You know, this is where once um, the trade uh, uh, liberalization and the WTO come into effect, uh, the transport costs, import duties and so on, they are basically uh, well regulated. But the soft costs, uh, they take gain importance. That is where I think the importance of the, uh, the supply chain formation comes into this one. When you are talking of the transaction costs, where uh, the soft costs are observable costs, all the soft costs, most of the soft costs, they go into the uh, supply chain formation stage. And uh, that is where one has to, one has to spend time and effort. And, and 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 costs. So once you have done that exercise, then the transaction partner selection becomes easy. As we see here, the transaction costs are uh, uh, are given here. They could be asset specific and so on. You can calculate the transaction costs based on uh, the delivery resource institutions and so on. And once uh, you have all these things, then you can select the particular supplier. So, three characteristics of transaction costs affect the asset specificity, uncertainty and frequency. Now, transaction cost economy is theory. When transaction costs are low, use of smart market governance and transaction costs are high, hierarchy is efficient. In other words, when your transaction costs are high, dealing with somebody in some others, this one, then you better do it yourself. And the transaction costs are low, you outsource it. Now, here with what we are trying to do in the supply chain formation stage is to look at all the transaction costs and find out for each supplier, for each component, who are the basically less transaction cost suppliers. That is what the supply chain formation stage looks at, which looks at not only the cost, innovations, risks, and so on. And based on all this, you try to select rank order the suppliers. So, supposing you look at how if you do it yourself how much it is and if the lowest transaction costs of the lowest of the low rank order, high rank order one are higher than uh, yours, then you better do it yourself. So, basically it depends on the governance when you want to do outsource or you want to do it yourself. In between market and hierarchy, there is the hybrid, uh, this one. So, asset specificity, supply chain specific assets, good relationships between members of network and cluster, assets such as specific dice and so on. Resources, now uh, this is uh, this is a slide we are now trying to look at what are all the asset specific ecosystem. In other words, the asset specificity is not just for the supply chain. It can come to the resources. In other words, the human clusters, financial institutions, etc., and the ports, airports, location specific assets. These become important depending on your vertical. Supposing you are you are doing oil, this one to import oil when the when the ship containing the oil comes, and the, it should have specialized equipment and uh, uh, a refinery nearby, uh, and so on. So basically the port where it goes, it becomes asset specific. And also in some of these uh, R&D and so on, you may require human expertise, particularly in biotech, you may require PhDs. If you are in IT, then you may require well trained programmers and so on. So, it depends, the resources could be, could be also asset specific. Institutions, for example, some of the governments create benefits to companies in taxes and tariffs. For example, special economic zones, special universities for training manpower and so on. You know, India has a lot of triple ITs for information technology uh, degrees and so on. So, here when you are selecting a particular supplier in a country, you should also look at what are the special economic zones uh, there, you save, save on them, uh, if you, you, can in, you can either uh, do FDI there, foreign direct investment or you can outsource to uh, a partner in the special economic zone who can uh, export to you. So, they are basically that is dependent on that. 
and delivery infrastructure, ports, airports, railroads, highways, and special trucks for carrying finished vehicles and uh, heavy power plant equipment such as boilers, temperature controlled warehouses, refrigerated vehicles, forklift trucks, guidance systems. So, these are all become highly asset specific and for example, container for iterations and also you know container handling and uh, having trucks to carry containers from the port into the city and so on. Some of these costs are not flexible or transferable across products or organizations. Infrastructure created, manpower trained, costs of attracting 3PLs, software providers, these are not flexible. You cannot transfer to somebody else. So, what happens is with the asset specificity of this, you are stuck with that particular product and so on. So, the supplier is creating all these facilities, for, have to create all these facilities for you. So, he may demand a contract saying that look I have created all this for you. So, you should probably stay with me and have a long term contract or do have some other some other way of uh, trying to make up for uh, the money that is spent on the asset specific system. So, there is what is called frequency and uncertainty. The frequency of interactions between the buyer and supplier is important uh, because that will create uh, the economies of scale. If it is a one time transaction for one year, then uh, you know uh, it may not be uh, worth the while. To require costs of specialized mechanisms created and established relations with partner network. You spend lot of money and effort for this. This is where if you compare a trader with a particular uh, manufacturer who is trying to build up relations. If you are a manufacturer, you are doing it for your own sake and your orders will be maybe three times, four times a season for uh, a year, once a, every season. But on the other hand, if it is a trader, he does for several people and several countries. So, that is where uh, he can get the, uh, the f more frequency. And environmental uncertainty can come from suppliers, customers, competitors, regulatory agencies and financial markets etc. The mode of governments used to coordinate partners depends on sources of uncertainty. So, if you have high uncertainty, then you better do it yourself. In other words, if going to any other country, it creates a lot of uncertainty. The, for example, in R and D, R and D, everybody does it themselves. That's because once you get out of this country, then uh, out of your hands, you may lose uh, whatever you have, the intellectual property, and so on. So basically, it all depends on what what the uncertainty interactions and so on. So what we have next is the coordination. That is the partner selection. So why is the partner selection? Uh, important. You have a, a list of all the players in the global supply chain and in, during the partner selection you use either analytical techniques or heuristics or previous experience or data analytics to find out for that particular order who are the suppliers. And this depends on your asset specificity and so on. You can find out uh, they use transaction cost analysis to find out what is the what is the total cost and you can minimize select the supplier from that and you can also minimize the risk take, take the risk and other things into account the second uh, this one in the under the governance is the coordination coordination is basically supply chain planning it is you have you, for your order you have selected all the suppliers all the logistics providers, manufacturers and so on. So, you have the you have the path for your supply chain. Now, for that path, you have to basically do tell people, communicate with all the partners, tell them what they should do, what is the, which are the product they are building, what are the specifications and what are the timelines, who should do what and when. So, that is coordination. The coordination includes software based method for it determines who does what and when communicating to everyone for every order selecting the suppliers 
assigning functions to them such as what to supply, how is it to be produced. For example, product tolerances and process standards and the production and delivery schedules given the product specification and communicating it to the chain partners. So, this is typical supply chain planning issue. So, you while, while doing this you may take into account uh, the capacities of your suppliers because if you require more capacity then basically you may have to go to two suppliers and so on. So, basically the kind of contracts you have everything matters here in terms of coordination. Then of course, this is a standard supply chain you have software from Oracle, software from ERP and others and there is lot of supply chain visibility that is and there are any number of methods including internet email and uh, uh, to, to communicate with the partners and so on. Well, the next one is building the control tower. Now, this is the uh, otherwise called the execution. Now, we have dealt with the partner selection uh, where you are using all the optimization algorithms and so on to select the partners to minimize the cost or minimize the lead time and so on. You have all the information from the previous step of global supply chain formation and you can use uh, the information about the transaction cost economics and all that to do this. And the second step is coordination. Once you have accepted the order, you have selected the suppliers. Now, based on uh, the information you have, you can use supply chain planning techniques to do who does what and where. Now, the issue, please remember, is you may get several orders for this is not a one time this one. Having done all the exercise on the global supply chain formation, you can you may get the two orders, three orders a day and each each order takes a different supply chain route. And for each of those orders, you have to do the coordination, tell which are the suppliers, it can be based on suppliers. In other words, in the morning you may get an order for, uh, for 100,000 uh, skirts and you may go through a route like uh, cotton from Bangladesh and so on and finally, it is ironed in Mexico and then sent to United States. And in the afternoon you may get an order, another order from Reebok and that order may go through some other route for the same, same things. So, the orders differ and it depends on the capacity at that time and also the, the value, the sweater from Walmart, you, they may require at $10, uh, same sweater from Macy's, it may be $100. So, the quality of the sweater should depend because when somebody is paying, they do not pay for the same price. So, now once all this is done, you are, you have planned for it and your process is in order and everything is assigned and people are doing it, how do you model, monitor and control whatever is happening. If everything happens as per plan, then you do not require the control tower, but it does not happen. So, there is a need for this. So, design of control tower, what do you, what is a control tower? It is basically has the information regarding your process what is happening where you have that information and you have to collect the data of what is happening. All the dates, the quantities and the quality and so on and then see whether everything is happening as per, uh, as per schedules. So, you know, cloud computing, big data analytics are fundamental to this step. Now, supposing you have all these partners in various countries. They collect all the data, you know, I have collected uh, an order of 10,000, this one. I have, I have done the dyeing of these items and then I have supplied and this data is stored where? 
that these are all small players. So you have to collect the data. Maybe it is on a cloud. Maybe it is not. Maybe you have to collect it to collect from their information, the Microsoft spreadsheets and so on. And have all this on a cloud. Let's assume that you have cloud and all these supply uh, suppliers place their this one in the cloud. And you have to use the big, big data analytics to to basically find out whether anything is going wrong or is it everything is according to order. You see, this is not human thing anymore because with these suppliers, if, if you are a big trader, then you know you have several manufacturers dealing with the 4,000 4, odd suppliers you know, all over the world to, to have a human uh, uh, decision making to find out whether anything is going wrong or the alerts becomes difficult. So you have to have basically somebody telling you whether a BPO kind of thing which where exception management is done. In other words, whenever there is an exception, somebody reports that to you and you give the solution based on expert advice. That is one way of doing it. Another way is you take the data and then use expert system, decision support systems, case based reasoning, hybrid control systems, etc. for exception management and so on. So the point is if everything going is going as per the plan, then there is nothing to be done. You just collect the information and give the status normal. But on the other hand, if there is an exception, supposing the quality of a particular supplier is bad, then you have to basically expedite that either that fellow does, the supplier does it again or you have to assign it to some other supplier, you have to do a, some expediting and so on. So basically depending on the schedules, the time you have, you have to basically decide what to do with this. So that is the kind of uh, decision, decision making that the control towers come. But currently the control towers exist in airlines, power networks, rail networks, etc. But there is the control towers for transportation networks is being talked about. For global transportation control towers being is being talked about, but uh, uh, not much in operation. But the entire supply chain control tower is is still a uh, hypothetical. This one, although people are doing it uh, uh, in some pieces. There are several applications uh, such as 4PLs monitoring and execution using BPOs. For example, Penske Logistics does this control tower execution uh, using uh, the BPO GenPack in, in India. So, for example, what Penske does is supplies, uh, it transports uh, the auto components from various suppliers in the United States to Detroit for all the big three companies. Now Penscape what it does, it does the execution, it tells which truck to pick up where and who is the driver and if something happens at this, the driver just calls a 800 number and the BPO staff fixes that. Sometimes consulting the, the original or by their hindsight or their experience, they may do it all by themselves. So the, the point here is all the trucks, the drivers, they are they're through GPS and through drivers cell phones, they are all being monitored remotely. This happens the truck transport transportation happens in the United States, but the monitoring is all done by a call center within uh, within India. There, when you have the call center with their human expertise that is there, and have trained people, then there may not be such much so much of automation that is needed. But still, if you want to, if you want to use this, uh, store this data and learn from the experiences and use some machine learning techniques for future use. Then it is necessary to design the control tower properly. So this is, this is being talked about but not much design of this one. And of course the execution uh, in terms of uh, four PLs provide end to end B to B logistic services. This is fourth party logistic services. They coordinate all services needed for goods transfer, warehousing a shipper and distribution ends. 
in other words uh, and arrange for trucks all through the journey. You know if I am a 4 PO which uh, I am acting on behalf of some client shipper then the shipper has no role in choose a choice of the trucks. I choose the trucks and manages customs clearance at ports and airports. It manages loading, unloading, cross docking, emergent transit as required and manage all exceptions through the control room, truck failure, truck registration, payments at customs, driver schedules, expediting if it is needed and so on. So, if you are talking of these kind of functions, then you can see the functions and importance of uh, uh, the control room here. So, this is the diagram which finally what we have here is this is the, the suppliers which are selected in the group formation stage and uh, logistics providers, manufacturers and so on. So, all the providers in all the countries and for a particular order I use the partner selection where I use the algorithms that we have and the coordination is I tell who does what to all these people for that particular order or if there are several orders to several orders to several people and finally, I use the control tower for execution. So, this is summarizes this diagram summarizes uh, the uh, the governance which is partner selection, coordination and execution. So, the supply chain design has basically two parts. The first one is the supply chain formation which includes the five steps that we have mapping the ecosystem to uh, finding the final configuration and the second step is the design of the governance and uh, which includes partner selection coordination and execution design of the algorithms and so on. So, this basically gives you an integrated supply chain design procedure which is valid for not only global supply chains, but local supply chains as well. But does where this kind of thing exist anywhere? The answer is no. Now, so basically that is about the global supply chain design, but what is the kind of talent that you require here? Now, you are having two steps. The first step is global supply chain formation. The second step is the uh, by the partner selection monitoring, uh, the coordination monitoring and control and so on. So, but the talent for the, the talent soft skills R and D execution abilities connections domain knowledge needed for each step in the supply chain design is difficult. The talent needed for the group working on supply chain formation there is more knowledge and data intensive and requires domain industry knowledge, political and economic factors of the countries and regions, strategy formation, innovation and risk evaluation and finally, use of analytical techniques for location selection and group formation. So, it is not just running the software, it is not running supply chain software, what it involves is, is, is is much different and project management requires skills to interact and manage with the government local communities. Local connections and knowledge will help get approvals quickly and resolve any dispute that may arise with landowners, land, land local communities and labor unions. And the talent that is needed for coordination execution could be routine during the normal times and can be assisted with tools such as scheduling packages, geographical information systems and call centers. Now, when I say routine, it is not that it is easy, but it is normally done in, in the supply chain management, uh, this one like using these kind of packages and others. So, people use the packages like ERP and others and also there are some supply chain visibility packages and several 
uh, other things which are available uh, which can be used for coordination and execution. But what is difficult is the previous stage which is basically that requires. Now in earlier days it was not very important because you have strong or dense ties with your suppliers. So they are usually local, you know them, you invest in them and so on. So you need not have to worry much about that. But if you are going global and if the markets are becoming volatile and if the countries and governments are, are, are changing their strategies every day, then the supply chain formation becomes a very important step. In emergency situations such as natural disasters, terrorist attacks or long drawn labor disputes, risk management teams assisted with this and support system should come on board to resolve the crisis. Of course, that is what the execution is about. So, to say as people say jata simaranam dhruvam, same is applicable for companies and strategies. What it means is basically any human being basically which is born is de destined to die. The same is true for companies and strategies. No company, no design, product, process, network, ecosystem is permanent. The ecosystems change based on the resource availability, based, the, based on the technologies available, based on the government, the elected and so on. All of them keep evolving and your designs, products, processes, networks, ecosystems must evolve, evolve suitably to keep the global competitiveness. So, there is no shortcut here. So, what are the conclusions that we have? Dispersed supply chain design involves formation and, and governance. There are two steps here. And formation is a very important step which is often ignored and creates operational problems to severe dispersions later. If you are not careful with the formation, then you ignore the risks, you ignore the government policies, you ignore the financial status of your suppliers, suppliers and so on, then you could get into problems later. Capabilities for the formation stage are much different from governance and may require relationships with government, trade, social groups, labor, resource owners and B2B and B2C delivery service providers. So, the social capital for the company is much more in the supply chain formation stage than in the execution and coordination stage. Execution is typically professional whereas, the supply chain formation is typically social. Implementation of the governance uh, needs sensor networks or big data management and cloud. You know implementation of the governance needs sensor networks, big data management and cloud computing. Now, what are the kinds of decisions you are going to make? Well, we know in the supply chain case the decisions that we need to make and what then that depends on the that decides the data you need to collect. And once you collected the data then you can use it for your decision making. So, the cloud computing basically stores all your data and it has all your algorithms and can be used with advantage for small and medium enterprises, hospitals, cities and villages. I mean whatever we have said here is basically for supply chain networks. But what is a hospital? I mean hospitals uh, and their sourcing and other things, patients, you can represent them as a service network, draw their ecosystem and then represent uh, how to design a, a, a service system for that. So, theory development needs integration of social networks, machine learning, optimization, game theory with supply chain networks. So, suffice it to say that we have dealt with in these two lectures that uh, the design of uh, uh, global supply chain networks and two important steps in this. 
the first step is is the global supply chain formation uh, which requires a lot of data collection and analysis and the second one is running your factory and which requires partner selection for your order and then uh, coordination and uh, then finally execution. The execution is a step which is not which is ignored in most of the supply chains today but uh, it is a step that is very important here. So, but we can see the importance of, of this why we are seeing a, tur a turnaround. So, for example, manufacturing is returning to US. Basis for global manufacturing footprint, total cost of making products, worker productivity, labor, logistics, a share of total cost, hidden costs and risk. So, the low cost advantage of China disappears with changed cost structure between China and the US. So, we are seeing now, in other words, earlier there is a low cost country advantage, but now today we see manufacturing is returning to US. So, you can see the importance of the global supply chain formation that we are talking about as things change. Now, then for certain products you can see here for certain products which are low end then still you food beverages and uh, uh, paper and wood products and so on they are lo local whereas uh, some of them uh, are basically outsourceable and so on. So, basically you can see that we depending on the logistics costs as well as the labor costs you see that uh, the whole uh, the, the outsourcing phenomenon is changing a lot. So, the future of global supply chains what is it an increase in the objective and subjective transaction costs from higher oil prices to buy local campaigns or murky protectionism government procurement in favor of local firms indicates that in the future supply chains will probably be smaller and more regional. Several companies such as Boeing are restructuring their supply chains. So, I mean this is these two slides show you the importance of supply chain design frequent supply chain redesign. It is not as though you could design your supply chain and sit back and relax for years. Thank you.